Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Marguerite Winter. I'm the manager of public programs and partnerships here at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And I'm pleased to welcome you to CAB's In Dialogue series presented by Hyman Auctions, which takes place virtually every Tuesday. The current edition of the Chicago Architecture Biennial, The Available City, is a framework for a collaborative community-led design approach that presents transformative possibilities for vacant urban spaces that are created with and for local residents. Through workshops, installations, activations, performances, and programs, the Available City invites a critical global conversation that asks how design can foster collective engagement and agency to identify new forms of shared space in urban areas. This evening's program, The Architecture of Black Space with Saku Cook, Jermaine Barnes, and Adrian Brown, examines how architecture responds and is shaped by the African diaspora in the United States. Adrian Brown is an associate professor of English at the University of Chicago. She is the author of The Black Skyscraper and uh, this Black Skyscraper, Architecture and the Perception of Race and the co-editor with Valerie Smith of Race and Real Estate. Saku Cook is an architect, researcher, educator, and curator based in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is the newly appointed director of the Master of Urban Design program at UNC Charlotte and is the recipient of the 2021-2022 Nasser Jones Hip Hop Fellowship at the Hutchins Center for African American Research at Harvard University. Jermaine Barnes' research and design practice investigates the connection between architecture and identity Mining architecture's social and political agency, he examines how the built environment influences black domesticity. Currently, he is an associate professor and the director of the Community Housing and Identity Lab at the Miami, at University of Miami School of Architecture. At the end of this program, we will have some time for questions with our speakers. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions at any time during the program. Please note that this evening's program is being recorded and will be made available for you to revisit on our website and YouTube channel. I will now hand it over to Adrienne Jermaine Saku. Thank you. Hey everyone. Thank you, Marguerite. Thanks, Marguerite. Thanks. So do we just do we just jump in? Yeah, I guess. Should we talk about should each of us talk about our approach to something called black space? Yeah, and, and, and why don't why don't we let you go first? <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I'm gonna keep mine super short. Um, so uh, I'm not an architect. Uh, I am an English professor. So my, uh, my approach to this is a little different than I think an architect would, uh, would think, of, uh, think about this question. Um, a lot of my work has been about how architecture is not a container for black space, but as an active maker of black space and blackness itself, that you can't really think race and racial identity without thinking about how the built environment is always um, you know, part of the shapers and makers of what Races, how it works, how we know what it looks like, feels like, the experience of race um, uh, without thinking the built environment. So a lot of my work has been trying to trace that that um, nexus historically through literature, through representation, um, through theorists of the built environment who often aren't described as theorists of the built environment, with people like Du Bois. People, poets like Gwendolyn Brooks, putting them in conversation with someone like Jane Jacobs. Perhaps if we think about, you know, a different kinds of um, curriculum of black space and black design um, that um, <laughs> that hasn't been taught on official um, architectural curriculums um, heavily in the past. So um, maybe that's enough for me from now. For now. <laughs> you want me to go next? Okay. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Um, I, I would say my approach is uh, sort of 
tangent to yours, Adrian, and that I'm, I'm super interested in the activity that happens within space. I'm super interested in the cultural rituals of black space. I'm less concerned with the physical space itself. Um, I know it's odd for an architect to say that, uh, I mean, we design buildings, we design spaces, and then for me to come out and say, I'm more interested in what happens. I don't really care about the building itself. Uh, so it seems like a very odd position for one to take. But I think I mean, that's the best way for me to explain what I do and the motivation behind what I do and the things that interest me. Uh, because I think the ways that Black people in here in space is so interesting and should be applauded um, and should be rewarded and should be held in extremely high regard. Yeah, um, I, I, I operate in ways that relate similarly to, to Adrian and, and Jermaine. Um, definitely reflecting on ways that um, Blackness and um, cultural identity affect the spaces that we live in, including the ways that we occupy space differently. Um, and uh, I, I'd say like a lot of my work is more about culture and identity than race, particularly, um, you know, especially the work that I do around hip hop architecture. It's, it's defining the idea that, um, that uh, there isn't a kind of default way that, that anybody um, goes through a space or, or um, engages with the built environment or lives their life, that we all have very different experiences of space in any, in any way based on our own cultural filters and how we identify ourselves. And people with different identities have a very different way of, of exploring space. And, um, and uh, which is why I, I spend a whole lot of time trying to break the, the, the notion of the, the canon, which is in architecture, which is very white and very um, male and very heterosexual and um, not, very, um, not very inclusive in, of other kind of, uh, of ideas ideas about space and, and identity within space. But yeah, so um, <clears throat> Jermaine, you're from Chicago. So how yeah. does like coming from Chicago, being raised in Chicago, operating in Miami, exploring your, your you know, expanding your <clears throat> architectural world from LA to Miami, and then coming back to Chicago to, to work with, to do work with um, the CAB? Um, it's, it's both extremely fulfilling. Uh, I mean, being from there, being from the west side of Chicago where my project lives. Um, it's funny, one of the weekends that I was in Chicago doing some of the preliminary work uh, with, with the young people who we did some of the designs with, I was standing in front of the cultural space. As I'm standing there, I hear someone call, calls me by my nickname back home. And I'm like, who is calling me? And I just keep hearing it and I look and it's my aunt and my cousin who are literally driving down the street and they see me standing there and they're wondering why I'm in town. Like, why are you here? I was like, oh, I'm working on a project right, right across the street over there. Um, Cause I totally forgot that my aunt and uncle lived right around the corner, like less than a block away from the site itself. And so they made me call my parents while I was standing there so that they can come over and, and see the project. And, and I think it's uh, those types of moments that are so uh, important to me because I left Chicago so young. I left at, at 18 to go pursue architecture and it's taken me all over the globe. And I'm extremely uh, blessed to have those opportunities. Um, but this is like my homecoming. This is like the, the big project that I'm able to say uh, claim to in an area that's so important to me during a time um, that's so important. And uh, I mean, my mom served food at our block party, like which, 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 which is pretty cool. So there's, there's all these people that came from all over the country to view the project and they were able to meet my family there on site while we were doing the work. And um, just grateful for the opportunity for that to happen, to show the skills that the city is talking about. Nice. And you're not going to tell us what that nickname is? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, but it, it, it's one that they definitely call me back home. <laughs> okay. And Adrian, you, 
you're you're in Chicago now, so you've been working in Chicago for a while, right? Like yeah, what, I have been. Perception, perception of the city, especially given this this topic of 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 black space in that in yeah. seg segregated city. That's a really really good question, and um, you know, when I came to Chicago for the first time to take this job in 2011, I had never been to Chicago, um, and uh, when you move to Chicago, people want to tell you a lot about Chicago. <laughs> oh, you move to Chicago, let me tell you where you should live, where you shouldn't live, where you should walk, where you shouldn't walk. You know, I've never been to a city where people had such strong opinions about how it worked and how you should enter it. Um, I'm, I grew up in the Maryland, D.C. area, so there's it felt like there was more spectrum of just like you're there in this amorphous kind of uh, trans metropolitan space where people don't. You know, people don't talk about Chicago in that way. At least they didn't back in 2011, right? I was like, oh, you're living here? Don't live on the street. Don't live on that street. So I had never lived in a space that, uh, you know, in some ways it's awful, right? And it's a, it's a remnant of the kinds of redlining that has shaped that city. But also in some ways, it's like everyone in Chicago is a theorist of Chicago. Um, it has an opinion, wrong, right? Well-informed, um, not well-informed, out of an opinion out of fear, opinion out of love. Um, that wherever it comes from, people are studying Chicago all the time and students and scholars of them. So um, there's something about that that's contagious, um, that, um, you know, someone who's trying to think about art, literature, culture, the history of perception, history of race together, Chicago in some ways is like the perfect city to be in, in terms of how people have had to think about their history of race and space is so intertwined in that city. And so much great thinking um, about that, those intersections has emerged from the city. So it's a really great place to do the work that I do. Thanks. What, what do you think, Seku, as someone who's not from Chicago, but has a project that's on a very, very prominent thoroughfare of Pulaski um, yeah. that's super important to the history both culturally and physically in the city. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 a, I mean, the word that comes to mind is privilege. It's a privilege to 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 um, be participating in this and to to do work on that on that thoroughfare. Um, it's definitely a part of the city that I hadn't spent a lot of time in, hadn't seen a whole lot of, and it's um, you know, you know, even you saying that it's, you know, Pulaski is a really important thoroughfare is like, I, I didn't even know, know that, right? Um, and, and I think I was calling it Pulaski for, for most of the time, because I'm trying, I'm, I'm, um, I was thinking about, because I'm New York centered, so I'm thinking about like the Pulaski Bridge in, in New York. Um, There's a Pulaski date in Chicago. If that <laughs> so yeah, so I, I guess there's a, there's a, pretty big Polish history and Polish community there too, um, as there was in New York. Um, but yeah, I, I have, I, as, as somebody who's um, not from there, I've spent uh, more time than I should in Chicago, I think. I've been there quite a lot of times. I, I understand some of the, the, the demographics, some of the, the um, the the internal politics of it, um, some of the architecture of it, but not not as much as I, I possibly should. Um, I, I think that um, coming from an outside in, um, then you have to start to rely on some of um, you know collective understandings of 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 blackness um, to to start to do a project like that in a place like that. Um, but you also have to, to listen and be aware and um, be inclusive. So um, I was very intent on making sure that the, um, the project wasn't just something that is coming from left field that's just going to be dropping down on, on the place. So it had to be something that's amplifying things that are already there, amplifying some of the uses that are already there. So you know, the shipping container is literally duplicating the shipping container that's already there. And as you walk, as you um, tour all the other sites around that area, there's so many shipping containers that are just in empty lots and backyards and um, that are, that people are using for some kind of purpose to just fill out all these empty lots. And then all the programming is, is kind of riffing off the programming that, that Wyman already was doing with their bike box and their raised planters and storage and all that. So that's what I wanted to do. But I was also very adamant about, um, 
about having the organization be included in and participating in actually shaping the thing. So um, they, they, they brought a bunch of their kids in from their program, paid them two days work or two and a half days to actually help move the things in place, help, help paint all of the surfaces, help put all the sod in the planters and plant the plants and get them watered and, and prepare the space for, for the opening. So I was very, very happy about that and, and getting to a place where it's like, okay, this is a collective form of, of creation and not just some random New York dude coming in or Charlotte dude, I guess now, <laughs> coming in and, and dropping something on the site. Was that tied to your, uh, your hip hop research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It was definitely um, a, a, a hip hop architecture exploration. Um, I, I still hesitate to call any project a hip hop architecture project, uh, but it was definitely um, influenced by some of the writing I had done about grids and um, uh, how uh, hip hop wants to violate grids, wants to work against grid. And the grid is such so dominant in Chicago and something that is always there regardless of what street you're on. And then bringing in the idea of the griot. So the griot, this West African figure who's a storyteller and um, story keeper, like the keeper of oral histories and, and performer and um, reflect on some of my writing about like the, the DJ, the hip hop DJ being a, a digital griot, somebody who's, who's actually disrupting all of these gridded forms of and structures of music, but also keeping these histories and telling these stories. So I definitely wanted to have spaces for performance, spaces for storytelling, spaces for exchange, um, and uh, do it in a way that's actually like chopping up, like, I've, like I'm acting like this DJ of these these physical pieces on the site and shifting them across a grid that's on the space. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, um, uh, everything I'm doing right now is informed by all of the research that I've been doing into this field. Dr. Brown, just sort of uh, the way that, that we're talking about space and, and um, Sekou gave us a peek behind the curtain into sort of how mm -hmm. his, his process um, happened. You have an amazing question here about the racial sensorium and understanding these sites and installations as a representative of the culture of these communities. Can you talk about that some? Sure, I actually might um, take that question apart into two, two pieces. So the first, uh, for me, the racial sensorium, I write a lot about the racial sensorium in my book, The Black Skyscraper. And for me, that's a way of describing uh, the kind of perceptual and sensory experience of race. You're not, you're not ever sat down and taught, okay, when you look at a person, this is how you tell what their race is, right? Here are the clues, here are the, here are the ways that you know, right? Or these are the ways that you make a guess, or these are the ways you intuit, or these are the ways you learn to place a body, right? We're not taught that in a formal lesson. You are taught that unconsciously. You're taught that in the way your body moves through the world um, and the way you're moving in three-dimensional space, right? That's a process of you and your body. Fanon talks about this a lot in terms of what he calls kind of phenomenological experience. So when I'm interested in the racial, what, what I'm interested in the racial sensorium is the ways that the built environment is always kind of shifting us and, and, and shaping the ways that we have those experiences. So what it means to see and experience race now in 2021 in one environment isn't the same as what it meant to experience race in another place in 1905. Um, and that to think about that experience and how we come to think and know race requires attending to you know, law, culture, but it also requires attending to the built environment, which is literally always shaping how we see and move through the world. So for me, the racial sensorium is not even so much about culture, but it's about all the kind of um, things that are under culture, <laughs> the habits and the little ticks and the ways you learn to see that you're never taught in a lesson, but your body learns. And how is the built environment always shaping the ways that your body is doing that learning um, around race? Um, but I have a question. Okay. <laughs> um, for both of you, you know, our, the 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 kind of inquiry of this Zoom is about black space, and I think you know a lot of us have been called to talk about black space recently uh, over the last year, over the last two years. Both of you are part of the um, 
Black Reconstruction Collective, which you know um, we could talk about too. But I wonder, um, in some ways for me, it's like more interesting to talk about what is not Black space or the misconceptions about that concept, Black space. So I wonder if you, either of you would be interested in talking about like, like the wrong way to go about, in your opinion, that the concept or thinking about or making or designing for a black space. Dude, that's tough. That's why you're a doctor and I'm not. <laughs> um, that's also where you have like critically acclaimed books and, 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 and stuff like that. Seku has a critically acclaimed book too. I don't have one of those yet, but give me, give me a little bit of time. I'll, I'll try to figure time. Critically acclaimed thought. Just write about this year and you'll, you'll be, you'll have that book. Um, I think, well, I've, I've never been asked that question because uh, I, I think, as, as, yeah, I've never been asked that. I mean, because typically you're right. We always are defaulted to talk about the same thing that we always talk about. Mm -hmm. um, we're, you're, you're defaulting the one to talk about hip hop architecture. You're defaulted the one to talk about the porch and these, and these various things. It's like, I'm so much more than these things that I've worked on and things I'm interested in. Um, so I've never actually, uh, put much thought into that process. But I think if to, to keep the, the prompt moving, um, I would say there is definitely a way to incorrectly construct black space. And that incorrect method is to assume that blackness is a monolith. To assume that all black people operate the same way in the exact same space, um, which completely removes ethnography, completely removes uh, legacy and migration from the, the story, and those things are critical to understanding the story. Seku and I are both Black. Seku's from Jamaica. I'm from the west side of Chicago. You can't assume that we just operate the exact same way if you put us in a, in a neutral condition. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions that just because we quote unquote look the same, that we all think the same or act the same or um, behave the same. Yeah, there, there's... Um... And, and for those of you who didn't get to see the show or don't know about Jermaine's work, like his, his project in um, the MoMA show was about all these different um, types of black that, that exist just in, the, just in the city of Miami. Like there's a whole uh, list of different kinds of black that exists right there and, you know, and kind of proving or reiterating the idea that it's not a monolith. Um, and, um, Conversely, I, in my project, I was looking at Syracuse as a kind of, um, as a kind of um, example of, of, of the black experience across American cities that you're gonna get displaced, you're gonna get replaced, you're gonna get moved out in, in the, um, under the guise of, of innovation and progress, right? That, you know, whenever something good or big or new needs to happen in a city, wherever the black people live, that's target number one for, for, for uh, erasure. Um, but to, to, to dissect the question a little bit more, um, I was thinking about um, Hollywood Shuffle, this old uh, 80s movie um, by, jeez, uh, oh, what's the, the actor's name, the stand-up com 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 the comedian's name that did Hollywood Shuffle? What's his, is, that, uh, is that Breyer? No, it's not Breyer. It's, um, uh, geez, Robert, Robert Townsend. Townsend. Yes, there you go. Robert Thank Townsend. you, John. It's, thanks, John. <laughs> um, uh, Robert Townsend with Hollywood Shuffle. And it was like um, this, this, this kind of like, there's this great scene where they're teaching the black people how to walk black or how to talk jive. Like the, you know, the, the white script writers and producers of this, this, this um, pseudo movie inside the movie and um, that's literally um, what I would imagine is the wrong way to think about black space. Um, this hyper commodification, which comes back to the idea of it being a monolith, like we can define this thing and we can reproduce it, um, which is what I talk a bit about in, in the chapter uh, in my book about commodification that, you know, um, there's this idea, this, this notion that um, African Bombado is saying that once, once hip hop got recorded, then it was over, right? It, it was dead once, as soon as it became something that you could buy, then it now is under this, 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 um, this umbrella of uh, a, a very singular definition. And now we want a hip hop product, we're gonna go to the store and buy a hip hop product. 
Um, and uh, I think all blackness has to resist that, that, commodif that type of commodification, especially um, uh, if we get to this place of really clearly defining uh, black space or black aesthetic or black design or, or black architecture, um, we have to resist the notion that it's this one thing that can be packaged and sold. It's, it's, it's a multiplicity of things that, that, that reflects all of our collective experiences. Mm -hmm. And I can, okay, Dr. Brown, you opened this can of worms. Just want you to know <laughs> everything that goes from this point, we can just point to that moment. Now, <laughs> I have a question for the, for the two of you, because we're talking about the wrong way to create black space. What about when you are faced with that inevitable um, situation of the good black versus the bad black? Mm. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you opened this can of worms. So I would, I would like to continue this going because I think this also goes into the available city and, and why so many of these parcels remain unoccupied and why uh, the artistic director, David Brown's research is so important um, because there is this polemic of the good black versus the bad black, the approachable black guy versus the unapproachable black guy, the big overbearing super black black guy over the more fair skinned black guy. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm asking you that question. Well, just to, I mean, I would start just to build on what you both have just said, like that, that is not just a kind of dichotomy that exists in the white community. That's, I mean, black people debate that question internally too, right? I was reading one of your interviews, Jermaine, where you talked about, you know, you were kind of also underscoring this, this idea of multiplicity, right? People want different things in their space. And one thing they want is to be able to protect their space, right? <laughs> to put it away and say, well, someone's going to tear this up. Who's, we have to make it in a way that's already kind of prophylactically defending against this other person who's going to come in. And that's, you know, that's, that's a black mentality. That's a white, that's a shared, men, you know, that's a mentality about race that, you know, you could see in many different um, ways of thinking about space and its protection. And so I guess I'm, I guess I'm interested in the ways that that dichotomy um, is kind of the, kind of built into the ways that in some ways people have been understanding what it means to protect space since the beginning of private property. If you think about the ideas of private property themselves being about the right to exclude. And uh, I've been thinking a lot in this new project about the origins of theories that Blacks don't know how to take care of property. They're either genetically disinclined or culturally disinclined after having been property for so long. And these ideas really informed early real estate theory into the 20th century, right? That Blacks just did not have the same kind of care for property that came from an Anglo-Saxon tradition. And so that idea of who is good and who is bad and who could take care of property and who can't, I think has informed a lot of things in terms of architecture, private property, and race co-constitutively. Wow. Okay, Seku, don't answer that, Seku. Don't answer that. Okay, yours is slightly different. Okay, yours, <laughs> oh, yours geez, is just yes. See, I was already like preparing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We're, gonna, oh, we're, gonna, we're gonna slightly pivot yours to yeah. the perspective of Native American Black versus immigrant Black. Mm -hmm. Native, that's, that's, that's a mouthful, like Native American Black. <laughs> yeah, like, like, like <laughs> That, that like Native American black. Um, uh, I, I always come up with, I always think about these really weird references. I'm thinking about um, that. I just maybe think about the Simpsons episode where like, you know, um, you know, this is for Native Americans, and then Homer is like, oh, like me, and it's like, no, 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 American Indians, and then Apu Apu is like, oh, like me, it's like, no, no, no. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, so. Um, somebody once said that the difference between Caribbeans, well, they're actually talking about like um, uh, Latinx people. The difference between Latinx people is just and and black people is just a stop on the the slave trade, right? <laughs> like you just got dropped off in the Caribbean before you got dropped off at the mainland, or you got dropped off in South America, right? So we all have this shared roots, these shared ancestries, this shared experience of, of slavery, 
of, of um, and it was different under different colonial uh, regimes. It was different under, you know, the, the, the British who controlled most of the West Indies. It was different under the Spanish or the Portuguese in Brazil. And we know that Brazil had one of the longest, um, the longest histories of slavery. It had um, the largest number of slaves came to Brazil than any other location. Um, and then, you know, which is different from the kind of uh, colonists that the, the, the quote unquote Americans who were, were slave owners, right? Um, and, uh, but so there is, so there's a whole lot of commonality that we, that we, that we have. But then when you come and immigrate from that place, you know, after like say 1920s or 1950s and come here, then there's a very clear uh, difference between experiences. Um, and even that um, starts to catalyze some other ideas about homogeneity, like that all Jamaican people are, 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 are um, share this type of way of thinking or all Jamaican people do this and you know stand-up comedians bring out all these things all the time and I'm always thinking you know I don't know them <laughs> like I don't know like this this random Jamaican woman who's acting up and doing crazy shit like I don't know who she is um it, it's all very different we are as Jamaicans, very, very different in, in multiple aspects. And um, there's all kinds of hierarchies in that too. We have our own internal racism and colorism and classism that, 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 that happens, you know, like uptown versus downtown, you know, high color versus, versus black. And, and it's, it's, it's really quite um, incestuous, insidious. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, so there is no real like, good version of that or bad version of that it's more like um what where do we connect what do we share as a common as a common language how do we uh relate to each other what are the commonalities rather than what are the differences and then once we start to find more commonalities then we start to have more space to move forward rather than um um tearing each other down right So yeah, um, I'm, I'm starting to scrub through some of this chat and some of this, um, these questions. Um, <laughs> Most of the ones we're, all, we're already getting to. I just, I mean, Dr. Brown opened the door, so I kind of just wanted to kick it the rest of the way open uh, because I think, because I think, I think it's interesting. And um, yeah, but she brought up this other thing that made me think about, um, you know, about defending. Blackness and putting a kind of facade out there to defend what's inside. I was thinking about like um, what I experienced when I went to Cuba the first time or the only time uh, uh, about 10 years ago where people would have these beautiful apartments inside, you know, in, in uh, Havana Vieja. And, but on the outside, it was all decrepit and, and not painted because they didn't want the government to know that they had money and, and had all this stuff. Do you, are, are you saying that there's a kind of similar thing happening in the black community that we're projecting something to the outside world, but, but have a whole different level of sophistication that's going on inside or behind closed doors? Mm. That's, a, that's really well put. Um... Uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about the history of the need for for black privacy and interiority in a metaphorical sense and in a in a very literal sense. Um, you know, you could also think about this in terms of the history of investment in black spaces, right? Where getting a loan for home imp improvements, right? Historically, in a black, if your home was in a black neighborhood. Had, was very difficult, right? So if you're having, you know, if 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 a lender is going to help you invest in your exteriors. <laughs> what, you know, what maybe you invest a little bit differently in your interiors, right? And thinking about the ways that those different kinds of pressures and um, inequalities, right? Systemic inequalities also shape the ways that people direct their forms of care and how and where they want to 
invest in the built environment, right? And maybe it's not in a facade, maybe it's in something quieter and smaller. Um, and that um, paying attention to black space is about reading all those different scales and levels, right? Which I think is also really, I see in your work and I think was beautifully captured in the, in the MoMA show too, right? That question of scale and the different scales of attention and forms of reading that one needs to bring to be able to think with and design for different kinds of relations to black space. Mm -hmm. I love what you said in there about the architecture of care. Um, I know that this panel is about the, the architecture of black space, but I don't think you can have one without the other because uh, like blackness is often so, so tied to trauma that mm -hmm. when you're able to celebrate things, when you're able to amplify care, um, it makes the, the work so much more powerful. Um, and I think for, for my project, Block Party uh, on the West Side is because as a kid, there were so many block parties that we'd have before school started. It was like a rite of passage. You knew that every single fall before Labor Day, there would be streets blocking off, I mean, cars blocking off the street with no permit. Everyone just understood the implicit nature that you cannot come down the street. That would be the collective effort of getting school supplies and getting food and basketball tournament and dance competitions and all these things. It was just, just an amazing display of care. And to me, that is black space. I mean, it's the occupation of the street. It's the occupation of those front porches. It's the occupation of the street corner. It's embracing loitering and not being upset at loitering and not wanting to criminalize loitering, right? That, that there's all these various threads that happen within it that are so crucial. Um, to understand in our culture that are, that are, that are missed um, by so many people. Yeah, like what, what you just said about um, uh, our history being, um, being rooted in trauma um, rang, rang true to me and that we, we're always using that trauma to, to develop new ways of care. And um, it's, it's weird to think about something that is like loitering or noise making or partying is like a, a form of, of self-care, but we can actually see that as self-care. Um, but I was thinking about trauma in terms of, um, you know, uh, back to this idea of the grid and, and, and I've been talking, you know, I've been writing about this and talking about the idea of the grid as used in architecture being not being this neutral device, right? And, it, and it's constantly seen as, as, as um, this thing that has no, is, is apolitical, com is completely apolitical and just about organization. But um, if you trace the history of the black body in this continent and its, and it's um, confrontation with the grid, it's always been an oppressive force. You know, starting with the uh, you know starting with the the slave ship gullies, right? Um, and the the packing organization of people and slave quarters and public housing and public schools and prisons and these are all these gridded structures, these gridded spaces that um, you know we're 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 always um, being confronted with, you know, even Michael Brown and Ferguson basically got shot for crossing the street in the wrong place, right? You know, cause, cause the city is supposed to be this ordered thing. And, you know, even if you look at an aerial map of, of, of the South side or the West side or Detroit, you know, um, aerial photograph of these, these areas that have all these, these, um, these uh, empty lots, then you start to see these desire paths that go across like breaking the grid and going in these diagonal ways. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of natural tendency for us to not see these things as these benign, um, benign forms, but they're, they're, they're representations of trauma. And we're, we're literally working to, to, to care for ourselves that in these ways that seem, that get characterized as rebellious or even illegal, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's something that I brought up in my lecture last night at, at UVA and, and, and it started to ring true. I got questions from, from first year students asking, why, why are we still teaching grids in the class? <laughs> you know, why is that part of our first year curriculum? It's, it's a, I mean, it's, it's important though, when you think about even something like the available city, 
And somebody asked, uh, how do we get our respective sites um, for, for interventions? And I can, I can speak for myself where I was given, um, I was asked, what would I like to be? Would I like to go on the south side or would I like to go on the west side to do my project? To which I immediately said to David, you have to put me on the west side. And if you're from Chicago or know people from Chicago, there's this huge battle of south side versus west side when it comes to blackness. One side always raises its nose to the other side of town. It's just, it's something that's been around for a very long time. Um, but my own selfish reason for wanting to do my project out west is because when we talk about the architectural history of blackness in Chicago, we always center the south side. We rarely talk about the, the contributions of the west side. It's always as if it doesn't exist. Anytime we want to reference thing, I mean, um, Lee Bay is this amazing cultural historian that used to write for the Tribune. Um, he has this amazing book uh, that he wrote as well. But it all focuses on the south side of Chicago. And so I asked him once at a, uh, at a conference, I was like, Yo, why didn't you do anything about the west side? And his response was, somebody else said that they would, so I didn't want to infringe on their uh, research. But then it's like, but then the book never came out. And so when it sort of seems like an incomplete history or an overlooked history mm -hmm. of our contributions and it's never seen in a positive light, right? So, um, so I mean, I, I selfishly claimed the West Side immediately and I told David I would, I would revolt if he put me out South because I, I, wanted, I wanted my side of town to be celebrated also. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have that kind of choice. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And, uh, um, uh, a late invite to the party and he was like yeah we got this site we got this we got this organization can you um can you do something for them I'm like Shh, sh maybe not I don't think I have time but let me see what I can do um but yeah to, and, and ironically I had the last time I was in Chicago, Chicago before then I had been doing some work with my students in um in Woodlawn um so on the south side, so I was like, in, um, I had developed a bit of familiarity there. And to me, physically, um, the, the two areas are the same. I, I saw zero distinction. Um, it was exactly the same, the same feel, the same people, the same cultural identity. It, it, um, but it's just another one of these artificial things that get put on us to, to be divided because black people didn't choose to live on the south side or choose to live on the west side. It was like, okay, you can't live here. So we're gonna mo move you out of the, of the, the space of, of the city center of the city, the desirable areas. And here's some leftover space in the south and here's some leftover space on the west. And it might be completely arbitrary which area you would have ended up in um, regardless of where you were coming from, you know, migrating from the south, um, it's kind of like the 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 um, the Tutsi and the, and the I'm 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 completely messing this up. The Hutu, the Hutu and the Tutsi, right? It's like a little uh, an, an arbitrary dis distinction that happened in Rwanda that was imposed on them from the from 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 white people from the colonizers, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, a, a lot of people don't know with regards to Chicago's history that like the west side of Chicago, specifically Austin and these areas, were not originally a part of Chicago. They were a suburb. So, so they were annexed in. So as you mentioned so eloquently, if you were Black, you had to live on the south side. You didn't have a choice. Like you lived in kitchenettes, which um, I employ our, our uh, visitors and participants to go look up what kitchenettes were and, and what they meant to black space specifically, because you'll find there were tons and tons and tons of families that occupied a single room within a larger complex. So you might have a three bedroom apartment and have 12 to 14 people because there's one family per room and there's one bathroom, there's, there's one shared hot plate or stove. I mean, in 2021, we call that collective living, but back in, back in those days, it was not that it was a kitchenette, which is something that you found on the South side. And then once, uh, Austin and those other suburbs got annexed into the city of Chicago, uh, and you had a bit of white flight because white people were like, "Hey, hey, hey whoa, 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 we're not, we're, we're not doing that. You're not coming over here, or whatever." Mm -hmm. And these people mm -hmm. start to move. Then you have this influx of people who are able to move into those neighborhoods, and you also have a bit of wealth 
that's also created and then you try to move in as well because the neighborhood that I grew up in was originally a Polish neighborhood and there's nothing but single family homes. I tell people all the time, I grew up in a five bedroom house with three baths because those are the, that's the housing stock of that neighborhood. It just so happened I had an extended family within that and that property it wasn't a nuclear family as we typically define single family in, in US uh, planning and zoning, but all, all of these things are, are, are entangled in an awful yeah. way. Just to add to that, I mean, it's so interesting, like even white flight is a misnomer, right? We talk about black people didn't choose to live on the side. You know, white people didn't necessarily choose to live where they wanted to live either. If you lived in a neighborhood that was changing over, or you wanted to live in a mixed race neighborhood, you couldn't get the loan. You would have to pay high interest rates if you wanted to do that. You couldn't get the financing. You wouldn't be eligible for an FHA mortgage, right? And so in some ways, I think when we talk about flight and movement, I think we, you know, we have this idea that flight was this choice, right? But all of those choices were subsidized and encouraged by the state. <laughs> and this just goes, I think, go back, goes back to the ways that the built environment is always shaping things that we talk about as choice, as preference, as desires that were <laughs> created, right? Made attractive and affordable for certain people and not for other people, right? And how much that question of choice is, um, is complicated when we start to look at that bigger systemic uh, picture. So should we make sure that we're answering some of these questions in the Q&A? Is Marguerite gonna come back and do that or should we just take care of it ourselves? I wasn't gonna come back because you were just in such this great conversation. I wasn't sure if I could <laughs> intrude. <laughs> I don't wanna break the flow specifically, but there's a lot going on here. No, of course, there are a lot of questions in here that we can kind of go through. I know, um, Adrian, there was one for you that was talking kind of going back to what you talked about um, in terms of privacy. And so are you able to explain kind of how you reconcile um, the desire for black privacy in your mm -hmm. current work on the anti-blackness of property rights? Yeah, that's just such a good question. Thanks to uh, thanks, Lauren for, for for asking it. I mean, I would say that I'm not trying to reconcile it, but I am interested in the ways that people have tried to reconcile it, and tracing that tension that I think exists within Black culture and Black representation. And one thing I've been writing about is the rent party as a form. So the rent parties um, were thrown largely in New York, Chicago, other Black metropolises in the 20s and 30s. And there were spaces where people who, you know, in black enclaves, the rent was very high. It was, it was almost half as much as the rent was in other, uh, in white majority neighborhoods because there was a monopoly, right? Because blacks could only live in this one <laughs> uh, small set of spaces. And so uh, they knew they had a monopoly on space. So the rents were very high. And so rent parties were an attempt to subsidize that living, right? You, you, print a card, you throw a party, you put some gin in the bathtub, you hire a jazz band and you make your living. And so this is those kind of, it's a kind of quasi public private space where there's interiority, they're not clubs or cabarets. Uh, they're, not, they're not spaces like that. They are private spaces, right? But the idea is you come in and then you kind of like lose yourself in the crowd. It's dark, it's sweaty, it's hot. There's no pictures of the rent party because you couldn't capture it. Um, it was just too, it was just too many bodies moving and thr you know, and thumping around in that space. And so, you know, the rent party is really interesting to me because it's this public private space. It's about staying housed, but not about possession. Um, that's trying to, I think, work with that dialectic of um, the need for interiority and to have a space to be, but also an interest in how is that space maybe not divine, defined by the right to exclude. Um, and so it's that tension that I, I'm drawn to when I'm looking at like archives of how people maneuver a black space and, and think about that particular question. Great. And then we have one other um, question I think that's for all of you. Um, so what are the main values and imperatives that you feel should be included in designing black spaces today and why? Maybe this will, if you can all answer this, will might be our final question. Um, I'm always an advocate to uh, that uh, architecture and design should be about people. 
that we have to um, just make sure that um, people are the center of every single form of expression that we have in the built environment. Um, if you know, if you know anything about architecture as a discipline right now in academia and in popular um, representation, um, it's a lot about image and technology and form and representation and all these very complex techniques and theories. Um, and what gets missing so glaringly, at least for me, is, is that is, is people, right? So if, if you can't find um, your own identity within what's being designed or what's being created, then you've, you've kind of lost the, the, the value argument, right? Um, uh, it's, you're not gonna value it and the work isn't gonna be valuable to anyone who's using it or encountering it. So um, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just doing as everything I can to, to center people in the conversation and in, in all the, the work that I do right now. I'll take the baton from there um, before letting Dr. Brown take us home because I'm sure she's going to say something extremely illuminating. Um, for me, it's safety. Uh, it, it's so hard for a black body to be safe uh, today, regardless of what neighborhood you're in, what side of town you're in. We see it far too often. So for me, centering black design or creating black design or being conscious of black design is creating designs that are safe and that people feel safe in them. So going back to Sekou's uh, point about centering the human, um, if you don't center the human, then you're not designing the safe space because you will learn very quickly that the things that you're taking for granted uh, are harmful to other people. Um, I'm not a designer, so I am the wrong one to close this question, but I will try. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a designer, but I am the interim director of um, Arts and Public Life at Chicago, which runs a bunch of um, arts and performance spaces in Washington Park. And I've been learning a lot of lessons that I've been thinking about in theory, but now <laughs> doing it in practice is very different. And um, I would just combine what Seku and Jermaine just said about people and safety and that people are gonna bring lots of different ideas to the table. And part of the process of design is bringing those people to the table and having a conversation about what people want together. And that, that can be a process. It can be a negotiation. It might be an argument. We try to change hearts and minds, build trust to figure out how you get somewhere together. And so um, that, that process part of, of not, um, um, trying to smooth over the wrinkles, but sitting in the wrinkles and the complexities and seeing where you get in those complexities, uh, the complexities of any collective endeavor, but also the complexities of kind of minoritarian design um, in particular. Um, yeah, but I'm not a designer, so I defer. I just want you to know I'm still in that line now. The sitting in the wrinkles, that's gone. And I'm not giving you any credit. I'm not it's yours. It. You invented it. You can have it. The moment I started, it's like, yeah, man, you got to sit in the wrinkles. And somebody says, where'd you get that from? Oh, you know, I thought of it. You know, it all came. It all came up here. <laughs> wow. I think that is a wonderful note in the wrinkles to end our conversation here this evening. I want to thank all of you, Adrian, Saku, and Jermaine, so much for being with us this evening and having this amazing dialogue and thank you to all of our attendees for being here and participating in this conversation um, and we look forward to seeing you one of our next um, in dialogue series here at the Chicago Architecture Biennial so have a great evening everyone thank you thank you thanks everyone thanks shout out to it's Chris who's in the audience <laughs> a lot of important people in the audience the the people that really matter are there I saw Craig in there. Craig is one of the people with open space, uh, I mean, open open architecture Chicago, um, who we collaborated with on Block Party. Uh, I know you can't see people's faces, but Craig's amazing. Um, Heyman Cross is amazing. All the people who are there. Waka. So Marguerite, I, thanks for hosting us. Yeah. There's Piker Gill earlier, too, who edited this beautiful uh, art produced, edited by Jermaine and Shaheen, this beautiful um, edition of Mass Context that came out around the biennial, beautiful work. Oh yeah, if you're still on the call, go get an issue, go get an issue, go get an issue. 
The Talk About Architecture Biennial is a platform for these types of things. And it's an amazing uh, compilation of, of people talking about black space, literally we're talking about now. Okay. All right, everyone. Good night. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Good night.